My name is Tabitha Scovel. I'm the assistant director here at CCHS, and I have a few announcements before I talk about Tony. We have this raffle. If you missed it on the way in, we're just trying to raise a little bit of money to pay for coffee and things like that for Lunch and Learn. Uh, we also have the sign-in book on right by the door. If you missed that when you came in, please hit it on the way out. Also, if you were interested in this program and interested in other ones, you might want to consider taking out a membership. It really does help us, support us throughout the year. We have benefits like free research for our members. We have events. We have a newsletter that's quarterly. You can sign up for our monthly e-newsletter. That you don't have to be a member for, but you could ask any one of us about that. Also, if you could please silence your cell phones, that would be wonderful. And if you didn't get refreshments on the way in, there's refreshments over here. There's bottled water and coffee. Next week's Lunch and Learn is the Faded Fad of Octagon Houses with Peg Ross from Green. She's the historian there. That one should be interesting. And without further ado, Tony Kissel has been researching baseball history in Cortland County for 25 years. After he retired from a sales career, he co-authored one book and is almost finished with a new book about John J. McGraw's childhood years in Truxton. Thank you for coming in, John. Er. <laughs> Thank you, um, and um, in the past, uh, some of my research have been about local teams. Uh, the Cortland Wagon Makers were a minor league team back 1897 for five years in Cortland. They played in a couple of different parks. Uh, it was an excellent team. Um, I think over two dozen players ended up playing Major League Baseball. So that kind of got my interest in local history. Also, I've done research on the Groton Coronas, who were around for about 30, 40 years, and then uh, television sort of was their downfall, but uh, they had some famous uh, ball players as well. And the book will be on sale afterwards. It's about a minor league umpire and pitcher uh, with several interesting, uh, colorful tales about his days back when uh, umpires uh, were literally taking their life in their hands uh, before <laughs> the game. Um, and um, there's a, one of the pictures I have you can look at later. This picture was given to me by the Hall of Fame, Baseball Hall of Fame. I gave them a local picture and they in turn gave me this one so we made a trade. And This is John McGuire, probably in his heydays. I think he's in his early 30s. He's with the New York Giants. Um, what, you, what you won't see today are photos of John McGuire when he was in his 40s and 50s. Uh, he was old, he um, had trouble with his health. Um, he doesn't look like the ball player he did when he was a boy. And the research I'm doing, which I hope to have a book published next year, is just on his primarily teenage years. The minute he moves on to professional baseball in Olean, that's sort of when most of my research will end. But I'll have a couple of other things to talk about as well. Um, and also, before I forget, I don't know if anyone from Truxton's here, but um, I've been in touch with Michael McGuire, whose ancestor, um, I believe, was also named Michael McGuire. And he has a website called McGrathSearch.com which is excellent because it kind of confirms some of the questions I had that most of the biographies written about John McGraw made several important errors about his early days. Uh, it's almost like the first one wrote the book and then the second one didn't bother looking up where Truxton was, just wrote down the same thing and then the third one copied it and then even his second wife made the same errors as the rest of them. So I've got the feeling that maybe her editor did all that writing. and um, uh, But she did mention that it was something he never really wanted to talk about. But his life basically is a rags to riches story. Um, it should have earned more than five or ten pages in any biography of him. Because it's kind of interesting. And now with the internet we can find out a lot of stuff about him. Um, but he was born in 1873 in April, and that also coincidentally was the year that it was the panic of 1873. Uh, it had nothing to do with him, but uh, the economy was tanking, 
and farmers were losing their farms all over the place. And in Truxton, his father, uncle, and his grandfather all lost their large farm. And that was the end of young John's career as being a farmer or a farm boy. Um, his father moved on to working on the railroad. The railroad was um, being built in Truxton and on Main Street. And um, what's interesting is how that railroad was going to change his life. And um, so a lot of what occurred when he was younger kind of led to uh, a, ch a change in his life later on, a uh, change for the better. But again, he was too small to really become a great baseball player. He was too poor. He's probably one of the poorest people in Cortland County. He grew up in a little tiny town of Truxton, which is in a hotbed of baseball compared to, say, New York City or uh, other uh, cities at the time. And from an early life, he was on his own. He was, you couldn't call him an orphan, but it was probably as close uh, to being an uh, orphan as, uh, as you forget. Um, hopefully I won't forget to um, um, go over two of his favorite, I won't call them toys, but things that he loved and treasured, items that he kept the rest of his life, which is kind of interesting, seeing as how he moved uh, around a lot. Um, and before I begin the slideshow, I'm going to kind of butcher this, and you're all going to laugh at me because I'm going to try to speak in an Irish brogue, <laughs> and I don't have a bit of Irish in me. So, um, one of uh, his teammates was interviewed years later, and he uh, had a lot to say about John McGraw, and he was describing what John McGraw in his first year <coughs> as a manager had to do to uh, win a ball game up in Tully. Uh, Tully and um, Truxton had played four games. Truxton had won two, Tully won two, and they were playing an important fifth game. There was probably a, um, a bet on the game. I'm sure somebody had a bet on who was going to win the game. The problem John McGuire had was, besides being 14, he only had eight players, so he didn't have enough players to play the game. So he got his eight players in a wagon and he's heading up to Tully and he's thinking, where can I find someone? So he goes out in this field and he sees this young boy and this, this boy is perfect for him because he used to live in Truxton. So even though he lives in Tully now, maybe he can talk him into uh, joining the team. So he, he talks to the boy for a long time while the boy is out in the field hoeing and doing whatever he's supposed to do. He's supposed to be working. And then finally the boy uh, gets convinced and he says to John, Dang yous, Jacques McGraw, I don't like, like yous, nor you bloomin' town. But with all of that, I thinks much less of me, my own buys at Thule. If yous let me play first base, I'll join yous. So help me marry. I'll play yous fair and if need be, fight for yous and the gang. And when he, met, when he said fight for you, is what that meant was typically if you brought a ring or to a ball game back then, you were going to have a fight either before the game or after the game, depending on when the teams wanted to have a fight. And so there were a lot of uh, black eyes and bloody noise, uh, noses uh, when players went home. So uh, sure enough, he went, uh, the game was tied. Trucks didn't want it. Um, this boy ended up in a fight with a, a player from Tully. And everyone went home happy after that. So, um, so one thing in his favor was where he grew up. Um, believe it or not, back then Truxton was kind of like the center of baseball in Cortland County. It was one of the larger towns. Uh, they. Their first game that I've been able to find went back to 1860 before the Civil War, where they played Preble. And uh, basically it was young uh, business owners who uh, had some free time and they would play a game. Um, the 1881 Truxton Grays, I'm sure nobody's heard of them, but for three years they were the champions of Cortland County, 1879, 1880, and 1881. 1881, John McGraw was eight years old, and according to his uh, second wife, um, he was the only altar boy that 
when he served a mass uh, at St. Patrick's in Truxton, used to uh, serve with a baseball in his back pocket. And he also had other baseball stuff in his other pocket. So he didn't go anywhere without his baseball. And he's eight years old, and his hometown team has won the championship three years in a row. So you can see at an early age, he was definitely hooked um, on baseball. Um, what makes this um, team not notable is this gentleman here is Bert Kenny. I don't know if there's any of his uh, ancestors here today, but Bert, a lot of the people that wrote about John McGraw always thought Bert Kenny was a owner that he played for the local team. He wasn't really any good, but he was actually one of the best baseball players in the 19th century in Cortland County. Um, he played minor league baseball for five years all over this area uh, for teams that would start the season and two, two months later they would be out of business. Um, his manager and one of the teams said that he was the best right fielder in the minor leagues. Normally if you're the best right fielder that means you should be promoted to the major leagues. But he had two sons at the time and he got injured. And I'm not sure what happened, but he never ended up playing Major League Baseball. So you could say he was somebody that John McGuire looked up to um, because he was a good ball player and he was familiar with uh, all the um, teams in professional baseball. Um, this guy in front, I don't know if you can see, he's holding the baseball. Uh, that is Eudorus Kenny. He's not related to Burt Kenny. Um, he would become a figurehead for uh, John McGraw in his later life. Uh, he supposedly taught John McGraw how to throw a curveball. So that got his interest. My guess is somewhere around there um, he was uh, teaching him how to throw a curve when he was eight or nine or ten. So that's one of the reasons why um, he became a success is because of the community, uh, the town around him. Uh, they kind of looked after him. So, so uh, getting back to Burke Kenny, I think I covered him <coughs> quite a bit. Um, he was 12 years older than John McGraw. This is kind of a nice uniform for back then, particularly since he wasn't in the major leagues. It shows the C for captain. I think this is his 1888 Elmira uniform or the 1890 Olean uniform. Uh, it was on, I think, eBay or one of the sites. Uh, somebody had a picture of it. Uh, he was 5'11", which back then made him, he could have played uh, in the NBA, uh, he was uh, that tall, but he had a long, long affiliation with the Truxton baseball team, Truxton Grays. Uh, he was a player and then he became like a player manager and then years later he was playing on the team when he was in his 40s. Um, he broke his leg once helping one of the local um, farmers with the uh, chimney and part of the chimney fell and landed right on his leg and broke his leg and that was probably the end of his career. But, um, he also gave John the manager's job in 1887 when he was 14. Truxton had an A team, which was their best players, usually in their players in their 20s and 30s. They also had a B team, which was usually high school age, teenagers, uh, or players that weren't good enough. Uh, he let John manage the B team at the age of 14, and that probably got him into it when he realized he loved uh, to manage. Um, he also, when he was with Olean, and he, he ended up getting released when he was uh, 17, he loaned him $70 and he said, you don't have to go back to Truxton as it has been and a failure, uh, do what you can, find another team. John found another team, he was successful, ended up playing in Cuba and Florida, and the rest is history because uh, minor league team started uh, having a bidding war for him, and he got to pick uh, his pick of uh, the minor league teams when he was eight, uh, 18 or 19. And he also, when Bert was practicing with the Elmira team, John was on a railroad 
car and his job that would land in Elmira, and he let John, when he was 14 or 15, practice with a minor league team, which I don't know if that was common back then, but he definitely was a role model for John, and you're going to see how he, um, uh, how John paid him back over the years. Um, <coughs> Okay, everything is going fairly well for John uh, McGraw. Uh, he turns uh, 10 in uh, 1883, and it was probably one of the worst tragic years for anyone that you can imagine. Uh, for his father, his own mother died <coughs> on May 25th, so the family had to grieve uh, dealing with the grandmother that had passed away. Um, John's mother, Ellen, was uh, pregnant with their eighth child. Um, the child was born in July, late July, and then a month later, uh, his mother died uh, due to perimetritis. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, which was an inflammation. Uh, Dr. Nelson, uh, after delivering the, the baby, came back, and the family is not sure. There were two things that they think happened. Either Dr. Nelson, who was with treating um, diphtheria uh, patients, that maybe he gave that uh, disease to some of the family, or it was bad well water. So I guess they'll never know the, the real uh, story of what happened. So le uh, less than two weeks later, John's younger brother Patrick died. Uh, at this point, once everyone in town heard that there was diphtheria in the house, they were quarantined, no, nobody could come and see them, they couldn't leave. Uh, the father has to deal with losing his wife and now uh, one of his sons. Uh, five days later, his sister Mary dies. Um, and the Quotman Standard mentioned uh, the deaths in Truxton week after week. They would say how many people were dying. It turns out it wasn't a diphtheria epidemic, but there were other people that died of diphtheria during that time. And then 16 days later, his sister Catherine died. So he's now lost four members of his family. Um, they were finally released from quarantine, and the, fam the other um, um, neighbors came to um, console them and try to help them and grieve them. And this, put a real bind in the family because the father worked on the railroad. Um, he still had children that he uh, had to take care of, but he was way out um, in uh, the sticks. Actually, they were on the North Road. And before I forget, one of the reasons I think a lot of this should be um, published is because all of these books uh, not only mention the year that this happened wrong and the people that were involved, they also mentioned that they, he lived on the West Hill at the time, which he didn't. He lived on the North Road, uh, right near Labrador Mountain Ski Area, mm -hmm. Route 91. Mm -hmm. uh, he, and he lived right across the street from uh, Schoolhouse Number 2. So I don't know what's there right now, but that's where they lived. And that was pretty far away from his father's work. So eventually the father moved him to town, he became a townie, and the father tried to keep him and the family together, but one by one, the brothers and sisters had to go live with friends and relatives. So soon it was just John and his father. Uh, John really wasn't cut out to, list, to obey everything his father wanted to do, and his father didn't want him to play baseball. Every time he broke a window with uh, uh, a ball that he hit through, um, uh, a window pane and cost the father 15 cents and the bills were adding up. So finally, um, John, one day according to um, his, uh, John McGraw's second wife, he, they, were, they had a fight, the father and him. He left, went across the street to the Truxton House Hotel. Uh, Mary Goddard also has an interesting tale to tell. You could write a whole book about her life. Um, she was the proprietor of the Truxton House Hotel. I don't know if she was the owner, if she was like a manager, it's not clear. Uh, and 
people came and went as far as that uh, hotel, but she was the proprietor with her two sons, uh, Will and Frank, or Frank and Will. They were the two youngest ones. So she had six sons, which um, doesn't really mean anything, except when, <laughs> when you realize that her husband died when she was 37. And she was left with six boys uh, from toddler to teenage ages, and she had to raise them all by herself. So she ended up raising them. Uh, a lot of them got into the hotel business, which is kind of interesting, uh, in Portland, Tully, and Truxton. Um, and she also had a brother who lost three or four of his family, just like the McGraws. And so she had to help them. And then, if that wasn't enough of a whammy in her life, when she was a teenager, um, I'm not sure if it was in England or if it was um, Ireland or if it was in uh, Truxton, but her father died, and that left her mother to raise nine children. So this poor woman had been dealing with tragedy all her life. So, so she takes John. John is 12 years old, um, and she agrees to take him. And then what she didn't realize was that John was going to live with her for four years. But what was nice was that John finally had two, you could say, older brother figures, and these two here, who would kind of keep him uh, on the straight and narrow, and so when he acted up, um, Mary had some help to kind of keep him in line. And um, so he lived there for four years, and he was a pretty busy uh, boy. When you think about most of his uh, classmates probably just worked on farms. Here he was, he was downtown in Truxton, right near the railroad station. He, he got the job as the newspaper boy for the Elmira Telegram, and he would trudge through the snow delivering the newspapers every day. He also delivered telegrams that came through, uh, I would imagine, um, from the railroad um, station. He delivered groceries and baskets to people all over the town, <coughs> and he picked up satchels at the train station. He drove O'Connor's cows to the pastures. He drove them there, then he drove them back, which uh, I have no idea what that would be like. But And for the hotel, he lit the oil lamps at night. He filled the water tank. I'm sure he had to take care of all the uh, guests that came and uh, um, take care of their rooms. And then he finally got a job. He also attended the fireplace in the hotel. And again, he was an altar boy, so he served mass. And um, he carried the farmer's fruits and vegetables to the markets. Uh, he drove the weaker cows from Truxton all the way into Cortland, which was 11 miles. They were going to the market to be sold. So we did that. And then finally, he got a job as a candy butcher on the train to Elmira. And a candy butcher uh, was a pretty decent job for a young person to get. And according to John's old autobiography, he sold glass pistols that were filled with candy, which I'm sure there's some you could probably buy through uh, eBay right now. He sold magazines, he sold bananas, and chewing gum. So he would go up and down. Um, the train would go from Truxton all the way to Elmira, then it would stop, he'd wait for the return train. He would play some baseball with Bert Kenny uh, in the uh, ball fields there, he'd get back on the train and then sell some more. So he was a go-getter, and he had to be a go-getter because these baseballs cost a dollar. I'm sure he lost some. If you remember, if you ever played baseball or softball when you were a kid, you were always losing the ball, you couldn't find it, or the covers were getting ripped. Um, and he also used it to buy guides. Um, his wife listed four or five guides that he kept. These are the uh, baseball guard guides. Well, his friends were probably reading um, stories about farmer's equipment uh, and farmer's tales. He's reading about baseball. Uh, this one is 1886. This is a reprint of the actual guide. This is exactly what it would look like. And what's interesting is there's 72 rules in here, and each of the rules has sub-rules and additions and kind of like uh, uh, amendments and stuff. So he memorized this. Uh, his uh, second wife said that you could see where, which pages he read a lot of, and he was reading about the pitchers because he was a pitcher. And every year, the major leagues were changing the rules. 
and he knew about them, and his other teammates had no idea what he was talking about, but they went along. The other teams usually would uh, end up starting a fight because they didn't have the rules. So um, that was kind of interesting for him that um, he became obsessed with these, and he still had them uh, 30, 40 years later. When he passed away, he still had all these old guides from when he was a kid, and probably worth a lot. It's kind of like we wish we kept the old baseball cards from when we were growing up, uh, because they're worth a lot now uh, for our items. So, and then in addition to that, um, Quotland Standard published the averages of all the Truxton High School students one year. And John McGraw, I think he was a sophomore, maybe 14 or 15. He had the highest average in his class of 92. Uh, he wasn't a brain compared to some of the other of his uh, classmates. Some were the same age as him, and they were advanced a year or two. But still, that's pretty good that um, he was pretty smart. And Bert Kenny always said that he could have been anything he wanted to be. So for what that's worth. Okay, and here he is, um, it's now 1887, this is him at 14. This is a copy of a copy, so the quality is not very good. Um, he's the only one in the picture that has that kind of a hat. Um, he probably got a lot of hand-me-down type uh, uh, clothing, and I'm not sure if this is a satchel or if this is something to do with what he um, was uh, doing. Um, one quick story I will tell you. About this time, he liked to throw um, rocks, and um, one of the um, fellow rock throwers um, is quoted as saying, Jack McGuire was certainly was a rip snorter. One stunt he did that they talk about in Truxton every election time. Old Seneca Smith, the village character, wanted to make a speech. The only elevated place in the village was the water trough. They put a rickety plank over the trough and the old campaigner was boosted up and began his speech. It was one of those early falls and there was a fair sized snowstorm in progress. The boys on the outskirts were itching to throw their first snowballs. Jack McGuire scraped enough snow together to roll a spear the size of a baseball and the temptation becoming too strong, he heaved it at the speaker. It went straight into his mouth <laughs> and let it shoot into the hole of an old glove and the speaker dropped over into the watering trough. Jack dusted, Jack ran away, and the meeting broke up. And then he gets going, and there was old widow G. She used to have lots of trouble with the boys. In one of those periods, she informed the youngsters that she would like to have a kitten to raise. Jack McGraw knew where there were several furry creatures that in their infancy approximated kittens in appearance. He presented the old lady with one, and she had a card over for several days before she learned that its parents were polecats, which um, I had to look that up in the dictionary. A polecat back then was a skunk. So, <laughs> so it's kind of good that she got rid of that. <laughs> so he was pretty um, mischievous. And here is the Truxton Band in 1887. Uh, the Truxton House Hotel is right behind them, and you can see uh, all the different band members. Um, there's John McGraw. Um, he's 14 at the time. Most of these older people are all either in their teens or early 20s. This was the brass band. They would play in uh, a lot of um, parades and social events, um, and they were together for a number of years. Um, Michael T. Roach is right here, and I'm going to talk about him next. Um, there's another Roach there, a couple of John's buddies here. Um, and then there's a couple of uh, the Goddards. These two yeah. are the Goddards uh -huh. from the hotel. Um, John's sitting there, uh, standing there. I don't know if he's got his hands in his pockets or what he's doing. And for years I've thought, why is he even in this picture? He's not in the band. But it turns out that this guy with the ba bass drum tried to teach him because he didn't want to be a drummer anymore. He was trying to 
pass along his duties or maybe get him a drum. And for some reason, John couldn't be a good drummer. So he, his job was to walk in front of this guy and hold, help hold up the drum during parades. So that's why he's in there. And my guess is this guy here or this guy is also to help this, who knows what their job was. So that's, as far as I know, the first picture of him. And you can imagine with his family moving around and everything that happened, they just never did have time for um, pictures. But um, so there he is, um, kind of looking right at everything. Um, Okay, this is Michael T. Roach, who was right next to uh, John. Uh, he's also from Truxton. Years later, in the early 1900s, he becomes president of the Empire State League, which was a minor league in central New York. Uh, kind of like that mustache that he has. But um, he also was the manager of the minor league team in Cortland for a few years. A uh, very uh, well-known and respected person uh, throughout um, the area. And now we get to 1889. Um, this is going to be John's last years in uh, Cortland County. July 4th, 1889, you have a team called the Shamrocks. They're out of Cortland. Um, it's kind of the forerunner of the Cortland Independence uh, semi-pro team. Shamrocks, they were all Irish. Um, they're probably all from Cortland. The only one not from Cortland is a McGraw at third base, but actually McGraw was the pitcher. Um, that was John McGraw. So he never talked about this game because his team lost to the Cortland Normal School 20 to 7. <laughs> so he didn't want to be reminded that they uh, got 20 runs off of him. But still, that's pretty good for a 16 year old boy to uh, pitch against the Normals. And you've got Ira Dexter. You got a McCarthy, Hayes, Haley, Flood, I think it's Tim Flood, Reedy, McAuliffe, and Bobby Mills, I think. It was kind of like a who's who of young ball players in Cortland who would go on to play pretty well. Uh, this was put in the um, paper, the box score, with uh, McGraw in there. And the second game he played, um, and you mentioned. They mention here that this was a very interesting game had it not been for the pitcher of the <coughs> East Homer 9, which was John McGraw, who marked every decision of the umpire by some of the most vigorous kicking ever done by an ex-member of the Uniteds. So here he is at 16, and local reporters are already mentioning that he's griping and complaining about every single um, <laughs> pitch that's being made. Um, and the third game, and also before I forget on the, well, going back to that other one, he rides in a, um, a hack, uh, some kind of like a little wagon, and the manager paid for him to show up in the East Homer field, um, and all the East Homer um, fans cheered him as he got out of the hack, which is interesting since when he pitched for Truxton, he was beating East Homer, and now he's pitching for East Homer, and they love him. So there was something about him even back then. Um, let's see what just happened here. Okay, okay, we're going to switch here to Homer Academy Field. Uh, East Homer and Homer were playing a three-game series, and there was a lot of betting on it. Um, Homer would have been the favorite because you've got the village and you've got the town and you've got little East Homer trying to play against them. Um, this is a picture of Homer Academy Field, which is right next to Homer Elementary. Um, their games were played there. They've been playing baseball there for 30 years. I think they played probably right up until the 50s. This is the Congregational Church. So home plate was right behind there and there was a barn there. Um, the elementary school is right there right now. So this was the site of the big third game between East Homer and Homer. Homer was so worried about the game that they got two professionals from Little York. Um, <laughs> Raleigh Wright, who ended up becoming the sheriff of Portland County, 
he was going to be, I uh, believe, their pitcher. And his twin brother, um, Robert Wright, was also going to be playing. My guess is because they were paid to play that game. Um, it was such a big contest that the Fireman's Parade was going to be held in downtown Homer at 3 o'clock. And they moved the time of the parade up to 1.30 so that when the parade got over, everyone would walk over to the ball field and watch the game. Mm -hmm. So John was pitching for East Homer against Homer in the game. <laughs> and it didn't end up so well. It was a close game. Homer defeated East Homer 7-6. to six. There's not a lot of written about the, the game other than there was a large uh, crowd. Um, and John McGraw was the pitcher and he let off. He pitched fairly well considering he was playing against a, a better team. And um, he pitched his heart out, and uh, that was the end. So at this point, his career here ends. The next year, he's 17 years old, and most people 17 uh, are still in high school. He's moving on to play professional baseball for Olean. Bert Kenny is the player manager. And he signs him, I think he's going to make $40 a month, which was a lot more than his dad was making on the railroad. Um, he does terrible. His first game, he makes eight errors. The first ball hit to him, he throws it way over the first baseman's head. And he said he was so nervous, he didn't know what to do. And uh, Bert Kenny has to release him because the team's in last place. And so he ends up switching over to Wellsville. And this picture here I found recently on the internet. Um, uh, you can see he's not really smiling. Uh, he looks a little bit older, but there he is with Wellsville. He starts getting better and better at this point. And the next year, after he comes back from Cuba and plays in Florida, he ends up playing for Cedar Rapids. He's probably the best shortstop in the league even though he's only 18. This is his picture. Um, so you can see how different he looked when he was younger compared to back when he was in his 40s and 50s. And this picture here, I don't know if you can see it, but this gentleman here is wearing a Cedar Rapids jersey. This gentleman here is wearing a Gainesville jersey. So I figured, well, these players must have played minor league ball. And I looked all over the teams trying to find out and realized there was nobody from Truxton around there that played. Turns out this was John McGraw's 1891 uniform for Cedar Rapids. And this was his 1891 <laughs> uniform for Gainesville in Florida. So for years, he would always donate his old uniforms to the town of Truxton. And, um, mostly New York Giants uniforms once he changed. So I thought that was kind of interesting that two of them got to wear his uniforms. Uh, and this team was a pretty good town team as well. Um, and then here's the Truxton team, mostly uh, Truxton uniforms, except this is Burt Kenny. It's 1905. He's wearing a New York Giants uniform. And he's in a lot of pictures with a New York Giants uniform. And I don't know if he was a player. And this is the Hotel Kenny, which he owned uh, through a lot of the money he made as a baseball player. So John never forgot uh, baseball. And then here's that picture. Uh, World Tour, I definitely um, want to cover this quickly. John McGraw uh, decided to do something nice for Burt Kenny. Uh, he was going on a World Tour. The New York Giants. We're going to start in New York City, and we're going to go with the Chicago White Sox. They were going to play games all the way throughout the western part of the United States in places where they didn't have Major League Baseball. They're going to get on a ship, go all the way from Vancouver to, I believe it was Yokohama in Japan. Then they're going to go to uh, China, they're going to go to Hong Kong, Manila, Brisbane in Australia, Sydney, Melbourne, and they were going to make a loop and come over to Colombo, and I think India, Cairo, Nice and France, London. They also went to Paris. Um, 
The trip lasted five months, and John McGraw paid for uh, Bert Kenny's uh, entire trip. His Bert's wife couldn't go because she was ill. She died a year later, so that must have been kind of one of the things that didn't work out so good. Um, Bert Kenny starts writing letters to the Cortland Democrat about his day, his trips throughout the United States and all the things that happened. Then he saves one final letter for the trip across the ocean. And it turns out it was a 10-day trip from Canada to Japan, but it took 23 days because it was like the worst winter storms ever out to sea. And the, the waves were 60 foot tall, much larger than the ship. Um, everyone in the entire ship got seasick except for Bert Kenny and two other people. <laughs> which him being older in his 40s and 50s, I'm not sure why he didn't get seasick, plus he was never been to sea. Um, the captain said it was the worst trip he'd ever been on. Um, there were 80 mile per hour winds and it snowed for four days in a row. And so the trip, somehow they, they finally got there and then they played, I don't know how many games, but it was 30, 40, 50, 60 games all over the world. They got to meet the Pope, King George V, princes, generals, Khedives of Egypt, J Japanese royalty, um, and they had a picture. Uh, the Great Sphinx. I tried to get pictures of Bert Kenny places, but it's hard to identify them, and maybe if I have more time, I can look up. But you've got the New York Giants, the Chicago White Sox. <coughs> and Bert Kenny somewhere, who knows mm -hmm. where he is. Mm -hmm. But um, these were famous pictures. It was a chore that it was designed to promote baseball all over the world. And it took five months. They came back to New York City and Chicago. Um, but if I can find any more letters that Bert Kenny wrote, it was kind of interesting because he told you everything they did, what happened, uh, what John McGraw was doing. But I thought that was kind of uh, interesting. Um, then you have the memorial game. After John McGraw died in 1934, in 1938, the New York Giants <coughs> agreed to come to Truxton to play an exhibition game against a team called the Truxton All-Stars. And the Truxton All-Stars were basically <coughs> every good young player in Truxton, a whole bunch of Hoffman brothers who um, played in the game. and. Cortland Cobacco, Cobacos, who were the semi-pro team in Cortland, uh, also semi-pro players throughout Central New York. So they got 25 local people to play against the major leaguers. The major leaguers actually mm -hmm. played for three innings straight, built up a lead. The Giants won the game eight to one. They finally relaxed in the last inning and they let Truxton score a run. But nobody really cared because it was designed to raise money for a statue for John McGraw. They've been trying for 30 years to build a statue or something to memorialize him. And if you look here, I like this picture because it shows all the people in the stands. And if you've ever seen John McGraw Field, you're thinking, what stands? Because there aren't any stands there. What happened was Cornell and Syracuse University both loaned all their grandstands. I guess it was baseball grandstands. And I I, I just picture what it was like for them to move those grandstands all the way to Truxton. But they had enough stands for 10 to 12,000 people. And the attendance was around 7,000, maybe 6,000 for the game. So it was probably the biggest thing that ever happened in Truxton. Um, and they did raise enough money for the statue. And the statue was built four years later. And you can see, um, has anyone not seen that statue? <laughs> it's, it's kind of in an odd place because you have to drive. And, uh, and then the epilogue, I thought this is a good way of it, ending a story about John McGraw, is back in 1913, uh, New York's playing Syracuse in an exhibition game up in Syracuse. John McGraw's father and his two sisters are at the game. I've got a picture, but I can't seem to print it somehow. <coughs> I think because of copyrights, but Bert Kenny takes John McGraw 
in his automobile that everybody in town loved his automobile because I guess it was like the, the biggest one around. He takes them to Cortland and at nine o'clock he says we're going to be there at 11 o'clock. If anyone wants to see John McGraw, tell him to come downtown. 11 o'clock comes, Bert starts honking the horn and flashing his lights. He turns from Clinton Ave down Main Street. And there's 300 fans in the Criterion Cafe, which is a saloon. 300 fans have been waiting for John McGraw all night. And John goes in and he shakes the hand of everyone, talks to everyone. And then after then after that point, he then leaves the Criterion and he goes to visit his old friend uh, Will Goddard at the Arcade Saloon. So there's at least, there's almost 300 people there. So now he's got 300 from one saloon, 300 from the other. They all follow him. He, goes to, he walks down to the uh, train station in South Main Street with almost 600 people following him. And he ends up taking the sleeper train for New York City because they have to play the Brooklyn Dodgers in a postponed game in Brooklyn. And I just keep picturing, it, picturing that because back when he was um, 17, here he left in a train not knowing how long he was going to be. And now here he is coming back. He's 40 years old. Um, he's going to make a round-the-world tour with Burke Kenny. Um, very soon he's going to play in the World Series and here he is getting back on a train and all these people are, must have been quite a day, uh, you can imagine what it was like back then, 600 people uh, uh, sort of ex ex es es escorting him. Oh. And then getting back to Eudorus Kenny, um, he graduated from the normal school, he ended up with a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Cornell, very smart, very bright. Um, for some reason, I'm looking at a book of poetry that he wrote. He wrote a few other things, and I'm read, looking, he wrote like a hundred poems in this book, and the, the poetry is called The Sets, which I guess back then made, made sense. Nowadays, we look at it and just kind of forget about it. But, so he wrote all these poems, and then I'm looking through, and sure enough, there was a poem called Jack. And I'll read it to you. It's supposed to be a limerick, which is kind of appropriate. Okay, uh, the title of the poem is Jack. There was a wicked boy named Jack. It was his greatest joy to rack. The nerves of his teacher to ridicule the preacher and all good folks annoy alack. The subject of my rhyme, this Jack, develops in due time a knack, a skill most surprising, and soon we'll see him rising like a hero in his prime, our Mac. Now he occupies a place, does Jack. He's the champion third base, G. Rack. And with reputation growing, also pockets overflowing, with a bright and laughing face comes back. So I thought, well, that kind of tells you a little bit about how people felt in the neighborhood that they would uh, write a poem about him and put him in there. His nickname was always Jack. But it must have been something. A lot of his root fans and rooters were probably proud of him. I'm sure he had a lot of detractors here. I'm sure he made a lot of enemies, uh, like he did everywhere he went. But um, so that's uh, that's what I have. Thank you. Man. I think baseball. there's footage of him as a third base coach, I think when he was a manager. Um, him batting, I think he was a little bit too old, because he was older than Babe Ruth and some of the other ones that you can see that have that footage. But um, there's a lot of memorabilia all over the place. It's kind of hard to find. And for his younger days, there's very little. I mean, helping one or two pictures of him from Cortland is uh, it's kind of too bad, but there are a lot of people that were interviewed, and um, that's one of the things I'm trying to focus on what they had to say, because some of these stories, you just 
they're hard to believe. And there's more stories like that, the things that he did. But he definitely got on the nerves of everyone. Um, <laughs> and um, yes, uh, several years ago when uh, Ira Cooperman, he yep. was uh, the one from New Jersey that passed through Truxton, and he, my wife and I had the privilege of attending the symposium in uh, Cooperstown, and. Uh, very, very good friend of mine presented a program of that game that was in Truxton, and it's all signed by members of the both both teams. And I'm a collector, and uh, it's probably the most valuable thing that uh, I have collected over the years. And uh, in fact, Mary Kimberly's husband presented that to me. Remember that character? Mm -hmm. That was quite an event, um, and I've seen that online, uh, the um, program, and uh, there were a lot of really good New York Giants ball players. Uh, Hall of Fame was Mel Ott, I think Bill Terry. Um, for baseball fans, they kind of know that, but, um, and then it's, I think it's Andy. Is it Ty or Tay? Tay. 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 Um, he and Jerry Moore were interviewed uh, afterwards, and um, Jerry Moore said it was like the highlight of his whole life uh, to actually play in that game. And they were interviewed in 1987, 50 years after the game, or almost 50. Um, and Andy uh, was worried because of how good the hitters were, and he was playing third base. He kept waiting for a baseball to come and uh, knock his lights out, <laughs> knock him out, because it would be hit that hard. But um, yeah, according to Moore, he said it was the biggest thing that ever happened in this town. And he was 16 years old, playing against major league uh, players. Um, and he said it was the highlight of his athletic career, and he became an auto mechanic, and he um, lived in the town. So. Um, but, and then they mentioned that some of the players went and sampled, <coughs> this is the season, they sampled hard cider at Jones's Cider Mill, and they also sampled some beer at Kenny's General Store before the game. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's interesting that they would report that about a major league team. It's a good thing John LeBar wasn't still alive. <laughs> They probably would have been suspended. But but thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.